Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Marche, the webinar director here at Advice Chaser. Before we introduce our guests and get started, I do need to do a little bit of legal housekeeping. Advice Chaser, the host of this webinar, is not a registered investment advisor. We cannot and do not give financial advice. Today's presentation is for educational purposes only and could not be considered advice for any person's individual situation. Advice Chaser regularly hosts informative webinars such as this one, featuring a variety of knowledgeable professionals, many of whom are licensed advisors. Any opinions, ideas, jokes, or principles expressed by presenters are their own, and however true, funny, or interesting are not endorsed by Advice Chaser. Please do not act on the information here today without consulting a qualified financial professional. Well, we are thrilled to bring in this educational presentation today. Attendees are muted, but we do encourage you to ask questions using the chat box and the presenters will answer those queries uh, what, if we have time during the webinar today. If we do not have time to answer your questions, I know we have a pretty full presentation today. Please leave your contact information in the chat box and we'll make sure someone reaches out to you after today's event to uh, address those. We want this experience to be as educational as possible. Please don't hesitate to ask for clarification or expansion of the material. Well, I'd love to introduce you to our guests today. Our moderator is Mark Scyther, and he is a partner and wealth manager with Kingsview Partners in Knoxville, Tennessee. He has a Bachelor of Arts in Economics from San Diego State University and began working as a financial advisor in La Jolla, California. Mark enjoyed finding innovative solutions to clients' as complex problems, and his desire to work with the entrepreneurial-minded helped him thrive as a financial advisor. As Mark honed his skills as an advisor and planner, he looked for a platform that would better pair with his desire to work with clients needing advanced planning and specialized fixes. He found a spot back in Northern California in early 2017 when he joined a trust CFO and assisted in integrating complex tax and estate planning with wealth and investment management. Since then, he has collaborated with Josh Saunders to build Kingsview Partners. Together, they assist individuals on wealth management and tax strategies. Mark, why don't you go ahead and come on the video and say hello to everyone. Hey everyone, uh, really excited for today's topic. Uh, back when I was with Trust CFO doing some of the complex uh, estate and tax planning um, assistance there. Uh, that is how I got introduced to Brian. Uh, asset protection is such a critical topic and it can get complex and hairy fast. And Brian uh, was definitely one of our um, go-to resources and a guy I just made sure I stayed in touch with uh, when it came to uh, really going through the minutia and finding things that work and are legal, right? Because you hear a lot of bad things out there, right? And, and uh, Brian was always really good um, really good resource for, um, you know, as, assisting us with pretty complex cases. So looking forward to today's topic. Again, if, if anything doesn't get covered and you need more follow-up, uh, you know, you can always, always reach out um, and put, connect. Put it in the chat. Yep, yeah, we're put, happy. It, put it in the chat. We will address it. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to introduce you to our speaker today. Brian T. Bradley Esquire is a nationally recognized asset protection attorney. Brian was selected to the Best Attorneys of America's List 2020, Lawyers of Distinction List three years in a row, 2018, 2019, 2020, Super Lawyers Rising Star List 2015, nominated to America's Top 100 High Stake Litigators List, nominated to the 2017 Law Firm 500 Award. Brian also writes on high-end asset protection. Brian and his team represent self-made entrepreneurs, professional athletes, business owners, medical doctors, real estate investors, and those investing in cash flowing properties and high net worth families. Brian, I'm going to go ahead and turn the time over to you. We're so excited to have you back and uh, here the, the floor is now yours. Yeah, thanks for, you know, having me back on, you know, right when I think I'm out, you draw me back in. Uh, it's going to be a great topic. Today, we're going to be diving a lot deeper into the world of asset protection and specifically, you know, this world of asset protection trust. 
And so in our prior segment, you know, part one, we talked about what asset protection is and, you know, what's going on in this modern crazy world and, you know, the broken system that we're, that we're living in now. And then we also broke down the two um, first two layers of asset protection, the LLCs, limited liability companies, and the uh, asset management limited partnership. And so for recaps of those, I just suggest you go and watch, you know, the, the part one video for that. There's a lot of great information there. This, oh, number, what's that? Oh, I, I just wanted to put on the screen here. This is the, uh, this is the title fortifying against potential litigation and credit creditors, which was our first webinar with Brian. And you can find that on the advice chaser website. All right. Yeah, and that's where we're going to, we, we break down those first two layers and then this then gets to that third layer, that third tool, uh, which is the this outer shell bad la you know weather layer. It's you know the dead of winter. You're we're in the frozen tundra now. We're in Siberia. You have a doomsday lawsuit potentially coming after you, and this is the world of asset protection trust. Um, the asset protection trust literally is the heart and soul of the system. At this point, you have, you know, multiple assets and your net worth is generally around, you know, 1.2 million of unprotected assets or more. Uh, There's not exempt assets and it's not, you know, including your 401k. We're talking about, you know, equity value and unprotected assets here. Um, and you possibly have a high risk profession like a doctor, a dentist, lawyer, CPAs, business owners, entrepreneur, you know, you're heavily, you know, full go throttle now in real estate investing. Um, we call our asset protection trust a bridge trust since it's easier to relate the concept to. When you're attacked by a lawsuit, we cross this bridge to the safety of the offshore Cook Islands and then we break that bridge. But be before we talk about what the bridge trust actually is and how and why it works, I want to talk about asset protection trust just in general. Um, and I want to start with, you know, what is an asset protection trust? And I really want to spend time with this. And after this, you're going to probably know more than 99% of attorneys out there about asset protection trust. And so if we go to the next slide, I think it's slide six. Um, you know, what is an asset protection trust? An asset protection trust is what is called a self-settled spendthrift trust. So all self-settled means is that you are creating it for yourself. You know, it's not for your kids. It's not for your grandkids. It's not, you know, Uncle Buck creating it for Orphan Annie. It's you creating it for yourself. And so they are for you, by you, as your own beneficiary. And they have the very important spendthrift provisions in them. And you're probably somewhat familiar with another type of self-settled trust called a revocable living trust. Uh, many of you have them or your family members have them. Um, they're the same in that they are self-settled, created for you, by you. The difference is that with an asset protection version of this trust, it includes these critical provisions called spendthrift provisions. And what spendthrift provisions are is they are provisions that allow you to protect your assets from creditors. They are the actual teeth behind it. And for those to work, the trust has to be not revocable, but irrevocable. So it's a very different type of trust. Now, there are two major school of thoughts. We got the international and domestic. You can set them up here in the US, you know, the United States, or we can go offshore to another country, international. Now, I'm going to talk about them both through a historical context. And it's very important if you're going to understand how the trust work and why the bridge trust specifically works the way it works to understand the two base components. And so we're going to go and start with the international trust. It came first. It was created in 1984 in the famous Cook Islands. So that was like, what, 38 years ago, almost four decades ago. So it has quite a bit of history and case law. And if you think about it, you know, the first LLC in the U.S. was created in Wyoming in 1977. So, you know, around the same time frame. I like and choose the Cook Islands if and when it's applicable, just because it offers the best home court advantage. Why it's the best home court advantage is because asset protection is what these trusts and the Cook Island statutes were specifically drafted for. They are the gold standard of the world, even today. 
And the greatness of the Cook Islands is that it starts with this statutory non-recognition of any other jurisdiction court orders in the world, including the United States. What this means is that if you have a judgment against you in the United States and they you know, took it down to the Cook Islands, your U.S. judgment is worthless. It literally has no value whatsoever. Statutorily, the Cook Islands is prohibited from recognizing it. Um, if somebody wants to sue your trust in the Cook Islands, they would have to start their case all over from scratch there. The person suing you would have to prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. That's the murder standard, the highest legal standard of the world, the 99% sure standard. Um, that is incredibly difficult to meet. In the US, here in the United States, a civil case is just a 51% standard called a preponderance of the evidence. It's the you know, yeah, I think more likely that's what happened or not. I'm really not sure, but, you know, let's just give it to them. But the beyond the reasonable doubt standard is incredibly difficult to meet. You can't get a contingency fee attorney to represent you because they're not allowed down there. It's unethical in the Cook Islands, just like it used to be unethical here in the United States. But that got changed in the 60s because lawyers realized that if we can't get part of the action, it's hard to get lawsuits going. The claim meaning the lawsuit is not amendable, meaning that once you file your complaint, that's it. You can't change it or amend it after discovery like you can here in the United States. It's common practice here in the US to file a lawsuit and then get in the discovery phase of it, start digging things up and then amending your claim and go, oh, but you know, we found a different thing and we didn't even know about it. So now we're gonna go and change your mind about what we're even suing you about. That's not allowed in the Cook Islands. You can't amend your claim. The person suing you will have to front the entire court costs plus flying a judge from New Zealand. And if you lose, you pay. And this is one of the single worst things that we don't have in the United States, that the loser does not need to pay the legal fees and costs of the winner. So if you get sued by somebody for like a completely bogus reason, I mean, just a completely frivolous lawsuit, and you spend $200,000 defending yourself, um, and then the judge just throws out that lawsuit, you're still at $200,000. That person that sued you is not going to be given the bill because in our legal system in the United States, that would discourage lawsuits. And our legal system is run by trial lawyers who don't want to discourage lawsuits. So we don't have that system. But the Cook Islands, they do have that system. So with the burden of proof beyond a reasonable doubt, whoever's attacking you almost certainly is going to lose. And so they'll be paying your legal fees also. So the disincentive is massive to not sue you. Um, not to mention that the statute of limitations, statute of limitations is short. Um, it's most likely already going to have, have ran because it's only one year. So basically, before they even take a shot at suing you in the Cook Islands and realize that a Cook Islands trust is actually involved, they miss their chance and are going to be barred by even filing a lawsuit down there. And then in practicing law and then taking into account all of our affiliates and, and firms and lawyers nationally working with us, and dealing with thousands of these trusts, we've had a sum total of zero plaintiffs that have actually followed our clients down the Cook Islands. It's just too daunting of a task. It's not something anybody has ever been successful at doing. And you'd have to just, you know, just pay a lot of upfront, upfront costs just to lose. And so the Foreign Asset Protection Trust has been around for 38 years with very strong case history of how they work and are upheld even against government super creditors like the IRS and the SEC. And then we have a lot of supporting a law up through the Supreme Court. What we see with the foreign case law is that even in the worst of the worst cases, the assets are still safe. And the offshore trust forces a settlement for literally pennies on the dollar. Even against governments like the super creditors we talked about, who generally are the only people who can even go and fight there and still lose. Now, comparing this to the four things a client wants, remember back in part one, I talked about ECCC, effectiveness, cost control, and compliance. So let's go back to number one, effectiveness. You know, the Foreign Asset Protection Trust gets five out of five stars. I mean, statutory non-recognition, right? Um, no other asset protection trust in the world is this strong. I don't even know of a single person who would argue against that a full you know, offshore Cook Islands Asset Protection Trust is as strong as it comes. Uh, if we go to the, the next slide, um, but we're gonna go through like the drawbacks. What are the drawbacks? Well, remember we got the other part of the test, control, cost, and compliance. On these, it falls short. 
This is, you know, the fully foreign asset protection trust kryptonite. The cost will be high. It's going to be expensive. The cost to just set up a purely foreign asset protection trust is generally around the range of $35,000 to $75,000 just to set up. And then on average, we advise ten dollars to $12,000 a year annually to maintain. Um, setting up a fully foreign asset protection trust is obviously not a small task. And if you're purely foreign, you now have a lot of IRS reporting compliance and disclosures to file every year. You have to file the IRS form 3520s and 3520As, which is a full balance sheet disclosure of all the trust assets and disclose all the trust roles. And even in some cases, they're gonna to ask to see the entire trust agreement with the IRS. And that form's not cheap from a CPA standpoint. Also, a lot of CPAs that I've been talking with lately um, have just completely stopped servicing this industry due to the time consume, you know, how time consuming it is um, and to, to do these. It's not worth their, their return on investment for the amount of time and energy they're putting into filing these things. Um, and if the assets are moved offshore, because at the end of the day, if you have an offshore trust, we would recommend then you're going to be using an offshore uh, bank account. You're also going to have to then do additional compliance called FACTA account tax compliance. And then, of course, you're not going to be in control of that trust. It doesn't work if you're in control of it. You know, for a foreign asset protection trust to work, you must be out of control and subject to a foreign trustee or that foreign trust company down in the Cook Islands. That's why they work so well. Um, and so for many clients, you know, they're just not comfortable with that. They're not familiar or comfortable with offshore banking. So the drawbacks, you know, are if we go back again over that four part test control, no, you know, you're not going to be in control of that trust cost, not very reasonable. It's pretty expensive maintenance and compliance. You have a lot of compliance and maintenance fees and disclosures. So while we literally have the most effective trust in the world by far, it's not something that we usually are starting out with because of the fact that we have all these drawbacks. Um, I have some case law here. Um, if we go to the next slide, we have the famous Seminole Anderson case. Um, I'm just going to briefly flash them on the screen and feel free to look them up. You know, I also have the cases in my legal library on my website. The clients in the Anderson case, they were criminals, like straight up. We're going to call it what it is. And the trust assets were made up of ill-gotten gains from a Ponzi marketing scheme. And the clients remained as the, uh, prote the trust protectors while they were in front of the U.S. judge, which is not what you want. And that was a major flaw in the plan that even weakened their plan. But what was the result? 90% of the assets were protected. They forced a settlement for literally pennies on the dollar, even with a flawed trust, like a flawed plan by being maintained as a trust protector. And these cases I'm using are just right now the purely foreign asset protection law cases. And they represent the worst case scenarios of the use and misuse of an international trust. In each case that we're talking about right now, the, case, um, the cases were flawed, the trusts were flawed, but in each case, the trust was upheld and, and it did its job and the assets were protected and safe. And so then we got the next slide, the U.S. versus Grant case. This is again an IRS case with $36 million uh, in IRS debt and the assets were here were still protected. So even the IRS were not able to break the trust and you got 100% of the assets were protected in this case. The next one we got the slow case, an SEC case. So another super creditor government case. And again, the assets were protected. Um, these are again, the worst cases that we could really even find. And even in these bad cases, the foreign asset protection trust, and in particular, the Cook Islands trust was able to protect the assets. And again, this goes to the effectiveness of the trust. I don't recommend people, you know, doing criminal activity or doing, you know, bad things. I'm just using these types of trust as examples of I'm going to take the worst case scenarios that I can find. And let's see how effective, you know, the foreign trust actually worked. And what do we find? Again, just they're effective. Which brings us to the other option now, the domestic trust. So let's talk about the domestic side of things. The domestic U.S. asset protection trust came around later um, after the offshore ones, about 10 years later in 1998. So they're newer with less case law. The first state in the U.S. to pass the domestic option was Alaska. You know, their theory was, why are we sending all this money to the Cook Islands and other jurisdictions around the world? 
why don't we do it here? You know, we've been doing it for years in Nevada and Wyoming for asset protection. Why not just create our own asset protection trust statutes? And so Alaska did. And not to be left out, we now have over 19 U.S. states that have passed, you know, domestic self-settled spendthrift legislation one way or another, like Delaware, Wyoming, Nevada, and others. Their motivation was, why do we want to send business to Alaska? We're already states known for all this, so we want in on the action also. So the states are jumping on board, seeing that our legal system is now a threat and that things need to get done to protect your assets. And so asset protection in the United States is very valid especially in these states and also federally. You know, lots of federal protection already exists uh, through other plans like ARISA, protected plans and other exempt asset classes. So asset protection as a concept is very important for you to understand is valid. How you do it is really where it gets important. The issue with the purely domestic asset protection trusts is that the domestic asset protection trusts are really only created for the benefit of the residents of those states. Um, and we now have problems of non-residents using other state asset protection trusts like California residents who do not recognize asset protection trusts and have no self-settled spendthrift legislations, you know, running off to Nevada and creating a Nevada asset protection trust. Well, the court stopped that in 2012 in California with a case called Kilker v. Steelman. Here they told a California resident they're no longer recognizing out-of-state asset protection trust, and this was upheld by the Court of Appeals. And so now we're going to get into, I think, a slide 15 here the, and breaking down some of the advantages here. The advantage of the purely domestic asset protection trust um, were really popular in the early 2000s because a lot of people were, you know, said, well, you know, why go offshore? It's less expensive and it's easier domestically. So, the, you know, what were these advantages? Well, cost, right? The cost of the purely domestic asset protection trust is lower since it's not a foreign trust. A lot of domestic attorneys said that they were never actually comfortable offshore, but they were very comfortable using a Nevada trust where, you know, I have a trust company who gave me a boilerplate language and they told me how to do it. And then I went and took a seminar and learned. Um, so these trusts can be, you know, as little as $10,000 to set up. And then the compliance is less since it's not a foreign trust. You have less mandatory IRS reporting requirements and disclosures. And you also don't have the same compliance because they're not foreign trust. Much of that compliance that we were talking about was related to the purely foreign asset protection trust. So Form 3520 and 3520As are not required. FACTA is not required because you have no foreign accounts. So that's great, right? You know, that's the good side. But what about the disadvantages? Well, on the negative side, unfortunately, you lose on effectiveness. Of all things, it's not that, they're not that effective. You know, we live in the United States of America. We have a constitution. First, the purely domestic trust has been around for less time you know, as the foreign asset protection trust. And we've seen rulings domestically breaking down now high profile domestic asset protection trusts. Courts are simply ignoring the choice of law clause. And the courts are even ignoring them now in states that recognize asset protection trusts and have self settled spendthrift legislations. So the legal landscape is shifting again. And failure means breach and assets lost. Uh, this is just unacceptable. You know, they fail because of the foundation of asset protection. The foundation is not recognizing another jurisdiction's orders. Yet, you know, like I mentioned before, the foundation of the U.S. legal system is the U.S. Constitution. The U.S. Constitution in Article 4, Section 1 provides that every state must grant the full faith and credit to the judicial proceedings of every other state. This means that, for example, Nevada can pass an asset protection statute, you know, or you can have a Wyoming LLC and an operating agreement, but it cannot ignore a California or Washington or Florida court order. So where the Cook Islands can literally throw that California judgment in the trash, Nevada or Wyoming, they cannot. They must actually respect it constitutionally. And so on this front, the purely domestic asset protection trust is very different from a foreign trust. Also, they fail on control. You know, on the control front, they're weak since you must make sure to give up control of your U.S. domestic trust to a trustee for that trust to carry any strength. And as I mentioned a few times, you know, we're now seeing a pattern of case law 
that are weakening the purely domestic asset protection trust. You know, we now have case law coming around. They started coming around in 2006, 2007, 2009. And what we find is that these purely domestic asset protection trusts have just failed. You know, they, they have not been effective at all. We have the Bately versus Mortison case. Uh, this is an Alaska resident who created an Alaska domestic asset protection trust. The courts used the 10-year clawback provision to include um, his domestic asset protection trust assets. And the result was a complete trust failure and loss of his assets. Um, if we go to like slide night. 18, I think we're on, where are we at? 7, 18. We have the In re Hubber, same thing in this case, just complete trust failure. Uh, we have Kilker versus Steelman. This was that California resident case I mentioned using a Nevada domestic asset protection trust. And the courts used a 10-year look back, you know, as well as creating new legal standards called a reasonable foreseeable creditor. This never existed before. And then the courts also ignored the choice of law clause again, resulting in complete failure and loss of assets. Um, the next case, same with Dell versus Dell. This is a Utah court, just completely ignoring the Nevada choice of law provision. Um, they applied Utah law and public policy reasons. And then again, this resulted in total failure of the trust and full loss of assets. Um, the next slide, you know, these cases show what is now a trend of failed purely domestic asset protection trust. These cases, in all honesty, except for Hubber, they had good facts, yet they still failed. And failure in asset protection, again, is not good. Failure means loss of assets. The challenges are, we have the full faith and credit clause, choice of law issues, meaning which law is the judge going to apply. Um, just like I mentioned before, when you think that you're going to go do yourself a favor by having a Wyoming LLC to hold a piece of California real estate, then to find out that California law is going to be applied anyways, the same thing is happening in the trust world now. Um, bankruptcy has addressed self-settled trust um, and established a 10-year look-back period. Even in these you know, 19 plus domestic asset protection friendly states, they created exceptions to what those trusts can even protect now. And judges have found ways around them. They're using now their superpower of public policy. Um, so with this recent trend in cases, you know, pointing towards all this new doctrine, along with the fraudulent transfer rule, uh, all this is affecting asset protection planning and even in states that recognize self-settled spendthrift trust. The modern transition of asset protection now is to transition away from older methods of asset protection towards more modern cutting edge techniques so that we can enable lawyers to offer a broader spectrum of solutions to secure your assets um, from this out of control legal system. And though you had a lot of you know, excitement in the early 2000s about the you know, domestic asset protection trust, I don't think you have that much anymore. I don't know very many attorneys that still use the purely domestic asset protection trust. And if they do, Generally, it's only used sparingly and for clients that live in a state that has the statute. You know, just like you wouldn't want to use a series LLC unless you're in a state that has a series LLC statute and the assets in that same state. The same is true for domestic asset protection trust and still only sparingly. And I think maybe because there's now better, a better solution that exists. Um, so we go to the next slide just to quickly touch upon this, because I find I think this is important to know as well. Uh, the Voidable Transfer Act became effective in California, you know, January 1st, 2016, and says that any transfer made is voidable before or after the transfer was made, um, you know, with the intent to hinder and delay or defraud any creditor. Um, and not receiving reasonable equivalent value for that transfer. So when you combine, and I pick on California a lot. So if you're hearing me talk about California, it's just because a lot of people live there, a lot of money there, and then they're buying, you know, buying assets and investing all over the, the, the nation. So I tend to pick on California a lot. Um, <laughs> and so when you're combining, you know, the case law and then Kilker versus Steelman and these statutes, um, there's a very fine line of what is actually effective asset protection for California residents you know, saying, I'm just going to go run off and create a Wyoming LLC or Nevada Asset Protection Trust or a Delaware Statutory Trust. Well, now we see it in the case law. Think again. Uh, this goes to the, the next slide. So now we, we, we see the lay of the land, right? We see the landscape. 
And we know the pros and cons of LLCs from part one in our prior segment. And now we understand the offshore and domestic asset protection trust and what you're actually up against and what we're fighting against. Um, so what do we do, right? You know, it seems to be a complete mess, right? This is where we get to a better solution now. This is where we get into the hybrid options, just like hybrid cars. You get really good advantages when you take the good out of each. If you are, you know, one of our clients, we have the benefit of using the best of both worlds called a bridge trust. It's the primary version of, a, or like I say, like the premier version of a foreign trust and a you know, hybrid trust. What we're doing is combining a foreign trust and a domestic trust. And we're taking the best out of both roles in the one trust. Um, so the next slide, it is a foreign asset you know, protection trust. It is a fully foreign Cook Islands asset protection trust. So it actually is drafted from day one as this foreign trust. It's registered in an offshore jurisdiction in the Cook Islands from the day it's created. And then for the purpose of the IRS compliance, it's bridged back to the United States purely for tax reasons. Its foundation is going to be, again, strongly planted domestically, also you know, from its creation by meeting this two-part test under USC Section 7701 called the control test. This allows us to treat that foreign trust for tax purposes as a domestic trust. So again, it's like having two passports. You can have a Swiss passport and a U.S. passport. And as long as you have your U.S. passport, the U.S. will consider you a U.S. resident and it doesn't care that you have a Swiss passport. The same thing is true with trust. As long as you meet this two-part test, the control test and the court test under 7701, the U.S. says this offshore trust is going to be treated and classified as a domestic trust. So as long as you have a U.S. jurisdiction that has primary supervision over the trust, we meet the court test. And as long as there's a U.S. person with primary control over the trust, you, we meet the control test. So how is all this done? Well, we recite a U.S. jurisdiction for the trust. Which one we use is going to depend on where you live. If you live in one of those 19 states that have you know, a domestic asset protection trust statute, then we'll use that state. If not, we're going to use Nevada. And that's just because out of all those states that have a domestic asset protection trust statute, um, Nevada is just the best. But we're, we're just reciting it, but we're not taking, we're not going so far as to create an actual Nevada, full you know, Nevada domestic asset protection trust, because that is not the goal of the bridge trust. Remember, the bridge trust is a foreign asset protection trust. We are only using Nevada as a jurisdiction to meet the two part test under USC section 7701. What we want is to have the option to be offshore if and when we ever want and need that power and the flexibility of being classified as a domestic trust for IRS purposes. If we have you know, no event of crisis, you know, or we're talking pre-duress, meaning before a lawsuit occurs, you know, when everything is calm and happy, the trust is treated as a simple domestic grantors trust, you know, just like a revocable living trust. It is literally disregarded for tax purposes. And it's a grantor's tr trust status, and that's that's key. The uh, you know the grantor trust status is key. This means that you have no IRS form thirty five twenty or thirty five twenty a, no IRS FACTA disclosures. Your assets can remain in your domestic U.S. bank. You have no need for an active foreign trustee. You remain as the trustee, you know, and this gives you control unless it's critical to give it away, you know, like post duress in a massive lawsuit. Um, and your trust is a tax neutral domestic trust and your maintenance cost is lower. So now we got post duress, meaning a lawsuit. You know, now what happens? The trust protector, which would be your attorney or your law firm, you know, you would want your attorney serving as a trust protector because you want attorney client privilege. So we would serve, you know, as your trust protector, we would declare an event of duress, which would then cause a few things to happen. One, that offshore trustee that we said was in standby, they're no longer in standby. They come in as co-trustees with you now. And then two, they now have the power to remove you as the trustee because you are in the jurisdiction where the event of duress has occurred. You know, and since you are there, you are vulnerable to the court. So we don't want you in control of the trust at this point. At that point, 
the offshore trustee can take whatever steps are appropriate uh, to protect the assets of the trust. This can include them opening up an account, you know, in Switzerland or Luxembourg, Uzbekistan, or, you know, any other valid jurisdiction. It can include leveraging assets, stripping the equity, selling the assets. You know, we're going to take whatever steps are appropriate based on the situation, based on the level of threat, you know, the lawsuit is actually providing. So the bridge trust is just incredibly effective and hits all the needs you're looking for. Again, going back to that four-part test, effectiveness, cost control, compliance. Is it effective? Yes, it is a foreign asset protection trust. It is actually a Cook Islands trust. Two, control. Yes, you know, you can be in control of the trust right up until the last second where it is, you know, apparent that it's not going to be in your best interest. Three, cost. Yes, you know, it's much more reasonable. It's still going to be an investment on your part, but it's not 50,000 to set up and, you know, 10, 12,000 a year to maintain. And then maintenance and compliance. Yes, there is none. You know, as long as we're not triggering the trust, there is no compliance whatsoever. You know, if we have to trigger the trust and then go to that full foreign asset protection trust, then you're going to have the compliance. But remember, at that point, you want it. You are willing to pay for it because the benefit of the effectiveness is now the most important thing to you right now. Um, and so I think we went over, I mean, a lot right now. I think this is a good spot to kind of recap all this. And I'm going to put it together with this graphic next that just popped up. And I think it's going to help. Now, this slide might look like a mess um, because I use my computer generally and I control it through the imaging, but I'm not controlling it today. But either way, we're going to make it work. If we go back over the tools we have, you know, we have the Asset Management Limited Partnership. You really want to think about this as your holding company. It's, it's the center structure here, right there, the key, the lock that popped up. It's going to be attached to these little houses down on the bottom left, which are your LLCs. This is your base layer. It holds your risky assets, your rental properties, your boats, your planes. Then you have the bridge trust, which is going to be up on the top right. And we still use a revocable living trust since, you know, this is also important for you to have, you know, it's your estate plan. So these are your components laid out here, you know, these four things. The LLCs are single members to the extent that we can make them. This eliminates a tax return and makes your accounting very easy. But since we have a multi-member holding company here, we still get the protection from it through the limited partnership. The other assets that are ho the holding company can hold directly are going to be like cash, stocks, bonds, cryptocurrencies, anything that's already safe and that can't hurt somebody else. It's not risky. There's no key, no motor, no door, you know, something you don't need to go purchase liability insurance for. It can just go directly into the limited partnership. Who controls that limited partnership is you, you know, you and your spouse do. You either control it directly as an individual person or through, you know, you can do it through an LLC if you want to add an additional layer of privacy. Who owns that limited partnership is the bridge trust. And that's the key. The bridge trust is actually the majority owner of the limited partnership. So the bridge trust actually owns all the assets. Remember, we're separating control uh, which is beneficial use and enjoyment from ownership and liability. So at this point, one of two things will happen. Either you die and everything passes through your revocable living trust, you know, it's very smooth. Your estate gets distributed. You maximize your estate tax exemptions. You avoid probate. You smoothly pass your assets to your heirs per whatever the instructions you create in your revocable living trust. Or the other option is you have some type of crisis, a doomsday lawsuit, you know, some event of duress. In that case, the assets under section 29-333, the bridge trust makes a unilateral withdrawal from that partnership and it demands all the assets. And then they can be taken fully offshore and just poof, you know, put into a safe place where the trustee deems that that's gonna be the best place to put them at and your assets are now nice and safe. Um, the next few slides, I think it's like slides 29 to 31. I have some actual case studies here if we want to break these down or I don't know where we are on time with this. Um, I can briefly just we're like- fine on, We're fine on time. Let's go ahead and go through these. Yeah. So here, you know, we have, this is pretty common, you know, John and Jane Smith, you know, they're both doctors. Jane has her own practice and John works for a large hospital and they have combined income of over 600,000 annually and they have the following assets. So where are we going to, where do we want to put all of this stuff, right? 
So they have their home in California, you know, one of our non-favorable asset protection states. The value is 1.8 million. They have a mortgage on it. So they got some equity in there. Um, Where's that going to go? Well, the homes, your primary residence is going to go directly into the bridge trust. You know, it's not going to go into an LLC or business entity. We're going to put that directly into the bridge trust. Jane has an office building valued 1.4 million with a mortgage on it. Um, well, you know, it's a building, it has risk in there. It's going to go directly into its own LLC. They have some rental, pro a rental property valued at 950,000. The mortgage is on there as well. Well, the rental property is going to go into its own LLC in the state where the rental property is at. They have a brokerage account valued at $850,000. Okay, that's not exempt. It's going to be their personal stock account, non-retirement account. So that's just going to be assigned directly into limited partnership. They have some passive syndications that can go directly into the limited partnership. They own cryptocurrency. Again, cryptocurrency, you know, it's, it's identifiable. It is an asset. It needs to be protected. So we're going to assign those accounts directly into the limited partnership. Um, Cars and household things, you know, those are all just in your personal name. They're not really assets. So we're just going to keep them in your personal name. Um, retirement plans like 401ks, IRAs and stuff like that. They're already going to have exemption status to them. So we're just going to leave those alone. Uh, if you want to go to the next slide, please. Um, case study number two, Sarah. She's an entrepreneur and has an online business grossing $3 million annually. Great for her. And that's over $500,000. And she's still growing. She's considering getting married and has the following assets. Her home. So where's her Georgia home go? Again, directly into the bridge trust. We want to put that straight into the trust. Warehouse for her uh, products valuing $250,000. No mortgage. Or oh, the warehouse you know, there, it is a property. We're going to put that directly into an LLC in the state that that warehouse is located at. Um, parents' home valued at $450,000 with a mortgage. Um, it's not her primary home. There's going to be some risk there. I'd recommend she puts that directly into its LLC. I want to put more assets in there because it's her parents' home. You really wouldn't want to invite more risk. And then next thing you know, that LLC gets sued and then her parents are no longer living in that house. Um, so we got to think about those type of things. Brokerage accounts, again, you know that we need to protect your personal stock accounts. That's going to go directly into the limited partnership. Cryptocurrencies, you know, you're going to hear me beat this point down a little bit. It is an asset. It is defined by the IRS. You do have to disclose in lawsuits or go to jail. Um, so we want to protect those, those crypto investments. Um, so those are accounts are going to be assigned into the limited partnership. Again, cars and household stuff, it, you, you could put them in a limited partnership. I wouldn't, I would just leave them out. You know, um, it's just all risk. There's no, it's not an asset. Retirement plans, again, they're exempted. Um, so just leave those out of the planning. We go to the next slide, the next case study. Uh, Will and Judy Jones. Will owns his own business and Judy has raised the family. The kids are grown and the last one is in college. They are now empty nesters. Um, Will is consider, um, concerned with passing his estate and asset protection and considering uh, selling his business. Judy is thinking of starting a business now that the kids are out of the house and they have all the following assets. They're home in Texas. Um, I, Texas does have a homestead exemption on there. I would still recommend putting her, the personal residence into the bridge trust. Just really lock that down and protect it. Especially, I mean, you're, they're talking about, you know, no mortgage, 2.2 million pure equity. So there's a lot of equity there. Um, office building valued at 4.4 million. There's a $2 million mortgage. So they got 2 million in equity there. Office building, put it into its own LLC. Office equipment, I would put into its own LLC. You can always then lease the equipment back to the you know, business and use it there. Uh, they, have, they have a mini storage as an investment property. We'll put the mini storage into its own LLC, lock that down, protect that. Brokerage accounts, you've heard me say that needs to get protected. Three million in their stock account. Let's assign that into the limited partnership. Cryptocurrencies need to get protected. That's going to get assigned into the limited partnership. Um, retirement accounts, those are going to be exempt. Um, the value of the business, so their business is valued at, you know, 19 million plus. Um, here you can uh, put that directly into a limited partnership or the bridge trust was pretty fine either way that we go around there. But now you see how we're, we're really protecting everything that these, these uh, case studies, these, these potential clients have here.
we go to the next one. Um, oh, I always like these, like what really happens scenarios. Um, so here we, we have Mr. Real Estate. Mr. Real Estate had over 150 million in real estate in 2008 with over 50 million in equity. He had a Cook Islands Asset Protection Trust with two domestic holding companies in the form of a limited partnership. In August of 2009, 80% of his portfolio was underwater. The remaining 20% was still encumbered by banks. There was some cash. And so what, what really happened with Mr. Real Estate? If we go to the next slide, we'll find out. So here are what happens. Well, we were able to protect 10 million in cash offshore and then 80% of the remaining real estate equity, you know, he was able to retain. So it just goes to, you know, the power of utilizing the correct type of trust and asset protection system. We go to the next slide. I think there's another one of these. What really happened? Mr. No Mr. Nice Brother. It could be Mr. Nice Brother, Mr. Ni you know, Nice Dad. You know, basically this comes down to uh, you uh, personally guaranteeing something for one of your family members. And it's always the person who's doing the personal guarantee who ends up the one being sued. So here, Mr. Nice Brother was a dentist and was, you know, um, talked into signing on a bond for his brother who was building a large real estate development company. Uh, he has 5 million in assets, all of which were in the asset management limited partnership and the bridge trust structure that we just went over. His brother's development doesn't work out, which most of the time, this is what the story is. And the bond paid out 17 million, which they sought to recover from our client, Mr. Nice Brother. So what's the result here? Well, we were able to settle this for 125,000, even with a personal guarantee. So again, just goes to the strength of the bridge trust. Um, and this is a very common scenario that happens. All right, M Mr. California, he owned a thriving medical practice with 27 employees and was also an avid real estate investor. He accumulated over 10 million in real estate when he realized that he had a staff infection, but not that type of staff infection. Um, one of his longtime employees was made aware that California wage and hour rules and realized that Mr. California hadn't been tracking uh, breaks just quite right. I used to do so many of these type of cases when I started out doing trial work in, Cal in, in all places, California. Um, this is very common. Um, her and her new best friend, the employment lawyer, filed a lawsuit alleging overtime and attempting to attract other employees to create a class action lawsuit. That's exactly what I used to do. Uh, potential damages were over 1 million. The next slide will tell us what happened. We were actually able to settle this for $5,000 to the original employee only. So again, the power of a proper asset protection plan. Let me go to the next slide. Um, I think that's kind of where we were actually able to get through all those. So that's yeah, we were. That was yeah. great. Yeah. Um, you have any questions that yeah. pop up before we kind of like give people my my final you know thoughts? Yeah. Yeah. We we had a couple uh, questions pop up. Um, you know, so one of them was if um, if all of my assets get sucked up overseas and a case lasts for many years. Uh, how do I still manage my wealth and take distributions back? Well, your offshore trustee can just be paying and maintaining your livelihood and your bills, but you're not going to be saying like, I'm going to be pumping in like a hundred thousand dollars into my savings account. And, you know, and it, and it kind of goes to like where the hiccup with, um, I think it was the grant, the grant case was like, they kept coming after the wife, you know, multiple, multiple times where she made an error in the grants case was, um, she started taking like $200,000 at a pop and giving it to her son because he wanted to live a lavish lifestyle. And so then the IRS, it kept opening the door for the IRS to keep coming back after her. Um, and so at that point, when you when you're, when the trust is triggered right now, we're only protecting the assets and you're, you're paying your bills, you know, like really um, the likelihood of it going that route is slim to none. Like, again, we've had to do this over 300 times with thousands and thousands of clients over, you know, almost 30 years now never had a person follow us down to the Cook Islands because of the strength of the trust. Um, this is why you only see generally like the uh, case law from the Cook Islands and foreign trust is the IRS verse, US verse, SEC verse. So the only people who can actually just waste the time, energy and resources to try to fight just to lose. So the likelihood of you getting tied up, very, very slim. Um, generally, with just the threat of breaking the bridge, they're going to leave. And, run, and flee away. If they don't ride away and we do have to break it, um, it generally, they'll take a penny, five cents on the dollar. If the case is settled, 
Um, a good question, follow up for that one. I'm not sure if it's there. Once I break the bridge, can it be rebuilt? Yes, it's not a one-way street. Remember, we're just dealing with IRS classification. So once the lawsuit goes away and there's no longer a duress, there's no need for you to be purely foreign at that point anymore. So we're just reinstilling you as the main trustee. You're back in compliance domestically. Yeah, which which we had another person uh, ask a question regarding trustees. So uh, they're, they asked, who is the trustee and do you know them before or after uh, uh, the, the event? Yeah, so realize initially in the setup, you're the trustee. It's a self-settled trust, right? Like all asset protection trusts created for you, by you as your own trustee. So you're the beneficiary plus the trustee. Your offshore trustee, you know, the one in reserve would be in the Cook Islands. We use SouthPAC. And the reason we use SouthPAC is they are the longest standing, most credible um, offshore trustees in the Cook Islands. They are the actual original creators of the first asset protection trust, and then the same people that the U.S. brought over here to the U.S. to create our statutes. So we just work with the best. So that's who we specifically use. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and then uh, someone was also asking regarding the LLCs into the into the uh, bridge trust. They they're asking if they already have a bunch of LLCs set up, can they? keep those and just fund those in or do they have to set up new ones? No, yeah, so you're, you're, you're planning is scalable, right? So if you're just starting out and like you're starting out with just LLCs and base layers, then you're gonna add those and merge those into that second layer, the limited partnership. You're not gonna connect it directly to the bridge trust. You don't wanna do that. What you're gonna do is merge your, your existing LLCs into that management company, the AMLP, have those disregarded into there for tax purposes and adding that second layer so you're removing your name as the managing members, putting that limited partnership as the new managing member of that. Your, your bridge trust owns a limited partnership. And so that's how that connection works out. Okay. And, and um, uh, uh, regarding the, you know, we had another person chime in with the, the domestic asset protection trusts. Um, with them failing so much, how, how, like, do, are they still... <laughs> are they still used? I mean, this person's question was more direct, like why would anyone use them? I'm sure there is a reason, but what, what's kind of your take on that? Yeah, my take on it is I think people have to, some people are risk adverse and some people aren't. Um, some people are willing to just say like, okay, I pay a, a, a lower cost and I don't expect myself to get sued. It'll give me some stronger protection um, and more of a deterrence and fight, but I don't have that doomsday, get out of jail free type of card. Um, I think that if you're talking to an attorney or, or some of them aren't even attorney or firms, they're like legal service providers. And let's say you live in a state that does not recognize domestic asset protection trusts whatsoever. And they're telling you, well, you're a California, again, I like picking on California. So just bear with it. Um, <laughs> um, you're a California resident and they say, hey, go, let's, we're gonna create a Nevada asset protection trust for you or a Do uh, um, Delaware statutory trust. California doesn't recognize them. And so you got to be very careful of, would I recommend creating a domestic purely asset protection trust for someone? If they weren't that concerned about risk, their profile was low, um, they, they understood the limitations, and they lived in Nevada or a state that recognizes them, sure, that's their own choice to make, but you have to explain the limitations of it as well. I can always convert it to a bridge trust later on down the line. Um, maybe they just haven't realized like the risk or, you know, they're retiring and downsizing. So there's pros and cons and everyone's life is going to be a little bit different. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. And, and then, um, you know, we, we had uh, a few people chime in with at, at what net worth threshold does it make sense to start looking at the asset protection trusts? Yeah. And so the asset protection trust, it depends. For the bridge trust or like a hybrid trust, it, it starts making sense to start actually really considering it around 1.2 million of unprotected net worth, which means, you know, the equity that you have in your house, not the total value. You know, like if, you're, if your house is valued at 1 million um, and, you know, you have a mortgage on it for 800,000, well, you don't have a million dollars worth of value. You only have $200,000 net worth right there. Um, so you need to realize like, what's our equity value? If we got sued, like, what are we actually, you know, going to be losing? That's where we say, and you take your retirement accounts, 401ks are exempt. IRAs, I don't include in that. So once your unprotected net worth hits around one, 1.2 million, and you have a high risk profession, 
and you probably have multiple real estate investments or so commercial property, that's when these hybrids, you know, really, these hybrid trusts really come into consideration. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, small, small anecdotal story there. I mean, it, looking at, yes, the difference between value and exposure, uh, you know, back when I was in California, where, you know, asset protection was a very popular topic that we did have someone come to us saying, hey, um, you know, net worth of $8 million, well, about 7.2 of it was in a solo 401k, a uh, self-directed solo 401k. And so letting, you know, that person got the sigh of relief of like, hey, actually, you have almost no exposure. Right, so you can still have a high net worth and have low exposure. You can also have, uh, you know, medium to low net worth and have everything exposed. So definitely get a a, a temperature gauge on what's exposed and what's not. Um, and then we we had uh, uh, someone else asking, is there is there any other countries that you guys use besides the Cook Islands? For me, no. I mean, if someone really wanted to be, I'm just gonna say, you know, uh, what is it, Pennywise dollar stupid, then. I don't recommend going to other countries and here like Belize, Caymans, um, Bahamas and all that. And the reason is they're considered more tax haven. So you're going to get red flagged. And then the issue with those is, are they cheaper? Yeah. Um, are they as effective? No. Uh, because of one, they're considered tax havens where the Cook Islands, they don't have any other economy. They don't deal with taxes. It's strictly asset protection. That's all that they do. Um, and then with like, if you go to a Belize Asset Protection Trust or Caymans or any of these other countries, we always end up having to build a backdoor exit to the Cook Islands. And so if I have to build a backdoor exit to the Cooks, I might as well just start with the Cooks and call it a day. Um, so if someone just was really adamant, like I don't want domestic, I'm not ready for, I don't want to do the, you know, hybrid, um, then I would probably say, okay, we can go Belize, but realize you know, there are trade agreements, there is an economy, you're going to probably be red flagged a little bit because it's considered a tax haven. Um, I don't recommend it. Okay. Well, uh, Brian, did you have any other thing you want to wrap up with? We're right about ready to be, to end here. Yeah, I would say like, I hope this all makes sense and clears, you know, up all anyone's questions. Um, my invitation is this, you know, whatever stage you're at if you're at the beginning stages and just you know buying your first few properties that's great go watch part one you know that means you're like you know five hundred thousand you know net worth or below um or if you're like four million ten million worth of properties and you know you're just not sure you have it all set up or correct either way i invite you to like reach out to advice chasers and let them you know put you in the right direction to talk to somebody um if you're lawyers or cpas and you have you know clients who you identify that actually can utilize these type of services and this isn't your expertise, don't try to learn the stuff as you go. Because, you know, I would say like check your egos at the door on this and then add these type of services to like family office type environments and networking. Find a firm that does this and then affiliate with them and then create a referral agreement if you want or, you know, learn from them at the same time. And then this way, it's a win-win for everybody. Your client is now getting the best service. You're adding value and then you're learning at the same time. Um, but don't just try to like, you know, do this all on your own. This is, there'll be a recipe for disaster. Well, Brian, thank you so much. I appreciate you being here with us. I want to thank the organizations that have made this webinar possible today. To our attendees, look for a link to a replay of this event. We'll be sending that out <clears throat> tomorrow. And you're welcome to share that replay with your friends and family. Herd Advice Chaser, we're all about helping you find a financial advisor who's a great fit for your life and your financial questions. Our matching service is free to you. And every one of our advisor partners is committed to offer a free initial consultation to anyone we introduce them to. Find out more by going to advicechaser.com and clicking on the link to find an advisor. Once again, thank you so much for coming and we will see you at another webinar soon. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you.